Hello, King. Um, good evening and welcome to the coffee chat with Osita. Um, the Mecaria Mentorship Program, like I briefed you, was a program I started online when Chifojo Madeokwe passed and I wrote about his mentorship to me. And many young people said that you also do the same to them. In today's world, I figured that our best bet was to create an online platform where we share experiences, bring people from various aspects of life and um, get them to talk to the young people about what are the possibilities of today, looking at it through the prism of their life, how far they've gone, where they are today, and what they think is possible going forward. Um, so far, we've had two people before you now on this talk. We've had a young uh, man um, who is a law professor, who first class University of Ibadan, Cambridge, McGill University. And then the second person is one lady, Arinze, Uju Arinze Ubuonye, who uh, Harvard Business School, um, working today, uh, is done with um, Boston Consulting, Visa, and now working in Texas. So the idea has been to bring motivation to young people. So I will start today by introducing my guest, Kim Bela Osage. I've written about him on the page. Um, I've, had a, I've seen a lot of comments. I will not waste time, but to go straight to him with the tons of questions that have come to me um, about Kim. But Kim, we would like you to just give us a little of your background and how you think that impacted on where you are today in life. Okay, uh, Usita, let me just say to you, um, it's, um, it's an honor to be invited for this forum. Um, I take particular delight in talking to uh, younger people, um, partly because um, younger people are always um, refreshing. Uh, they have not become uh, too jaded and too cynical. Um, and in addition to that, um, I remember very much my uh, father speaking to me as a young as a young man, I should say, and the influence it had on me. And therefore, there's a very real sense in which I very much want to give back uh, the benefits that I have had uh, from being spoken to as a young man and try to give some of that back uh, to the next generation. Um, um, Usita, you, 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 are, you are clearly one of the, um, should I say, the ablest um, of your generation. And um, uh, my friendship and interaction with you um, has been beneficial, I trust, for both of us. And um, I think that um, when you asked me to come, I said to myself, this is something I must do. So Usita, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and I'm honored to appear in front of all the young people listening in. Um, I'd like to um, say to you that in many respects, um, I grew up in a very, should I say, a multi-ethnic background. Um, I say a multi-ethnic background in the sense that though both of my parents were from Benin City, my father was the, uh, I think, the first doctor in in the Benin region. My mother was the first nurse in the in, 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 in the in the area. Um, but the Usagi family in Benin is a family that had very much had have had had contact with all the three major ethnic groups in our childhood. So I grew up in in, a, in, a, in an atmosphere in which um, we had a lot of Hausa, Fulani, and Northern friends, family friends of ours. Uh, many had uh, traded or lived with my grandfather uh, in Benin. Uh, my father worked with a lot of them uh, in Lagos. Uh, we had a lot of uh, people from the eastern part of Nigeria who uh, worked in businesses with my grandfather. And of course, um, my career and uh, my childhood was largely based in Lagos. So I, I would say that I grew up in an achievement-oriented uh, family, uh, which was multi-ethnic. Uh, my father was Muslim. My mother was a Catholic. Um, and that has had an impact on me. Um, and it, it, in, the, in the sense that you find me um, very open and hopefully very tolerant in, in the way I approach um, ethnic differences and religious differences. And of course, I was very much driven by my parents 
uh, to be very achievement oriented. And they made it very clear to all of us as children um, that academic success, professional success uh, was very important, um, um, was one of the defining attributes in life, uh, that a person cannot just live uh, on the basis of who your father is and who your mother is. And um, they were also very uh, insistent uh, that nobody should make a career only of the government and that a person, if he is really to be a success, uh, must be able to live outside of the government and have a successful life, a successful career um, outside of the government where one can gain a measure of independence. Um, that, that approach, or that, that philosophy has very much guided me uh, throughout my own uh, life um, as well. Um, my, my, my parents, uh, and I'll say my, no, I'll say my parents, I should say, um, did a lot for me in uh, pushing me uh, to, to, to the very limits of my own intellectual and professional ability. Um, they were always very supportive of what I was doing. Um, and one of the things that I can remember, even as a child, hearing from my father was that uh, in life, you must take risks in life. And that to simply play it safe all the time in, in your life is not a well is not a life well lived. And uh, the second thing he, he inculcated in me is that uh, failure is an is an inevitable part of life, and that the person who has not failed has not failed because he has not dared enough, has not attempted enough, and he has not tried hard enough. Um, if you set your goals large and you sit, should set your goals large you will often fail um, but the key to life is the way you react to failure the way you learn from failure the way you get on your feet after failure and the way you proceed um, after that so Sita, i would say that those are the basic guiding principles that i got from 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 my childhood and uh, were reinforced by my uh, education, um, in particular King's College, which was a very national institution, um, an international sixth form college that I went to, United World Colleges, which had students from over uh, 60 or 70 different countries. They all reinforced in me uh, a deep sense of, um, of, of, of wanting professional success, uh, being uh, of service, um, um, and at the same time, uh, always being open to different ethnic groups different countries and, and different religions. Now, Kim, let me quickly point in there. Um, yes. You were at King's College, Lagos. Yes. Um, what was it like to go to King's College, Lagos? Was it a place for children of the connected and the rich? Um, was it, were you in King's College because your father was a doctor living in Lagos? Or uh, was it a marriage driven place at that time? Um, King's College was a totally merit-driven place at that time, totally. And, um, and let me just give you some statistics. Um, there were roughly 60 students in the class. In 19, I, I, I applied in 1965 and I got in 1966. Um, I, was the, I was the youngest guy in my class, or maybe the second youngest class in my, in my class. I think that the three youngest people in my class were myself, Atidor Peterside and Mr. Udoma Udo Udoma. Now, of the, of the 60 of us in the class, there were only four of us who grew up in Ikoyi or Victoria Island. All right? Mm. So, so I give that statistic just to, just to say, if you regard um, growing up in Ikoyi and Victoria Island, um, having a corona school education as an indication of um, of privilege there were only four of us who came from corona school or or Ikoi and or victoria island and um, one of the things that i loved about king's college was that i met people who were very different from me in the sense of i grew to appreciate and um, and respect uh, people who came from much poorer backgrounds, who came from low, low income, but due to um, their, 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 their having done very well at the examination, had entered into King's College. And in fact, the fascinating thing about the school at the time was that those of us 
from privileged backgrounds, we were actually, um, I wouldn't say we were condemned, but I would just say that we were constantly being forced to, to, to confirm, all right, that we were serious, that we were not playful, that we were not irresponsible, and that we had the toughness to succeed in life. So there was mm. no way we were ever allowed to feel that we were superior in any way. And I think that that left a huge impact on my life because um, it has always left me with one, a social conscience that is always understanding that you are where you are, not necessarily because you're better than anybody else, but much more because, partly because you've applied yourself, but in addition to that, because you were given opportunities. And that a large number of people, they are where they are today, not because they're not talented, but because they have not been given opportunities. So, so, so King's College was very merit-driven. The second thing I also found about King's College, which I loved, was that um, we had students from all over the country. And certainly at that time, and I do not know whether things have changed now, um, we had students from the East, we had a lot of students from the southern minorities. We had students from the, from the, from the West. And we had a lot of students who also came from the North. A, a, one of them, one, a few came in from one with us, and some came in lower six. And um, I can always remember the Northern student from Bauchi, he, who came in from one. He was called Moru Sintali Alka. And he was a subject of, 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 of at the beginning, um, a lot of amusement because he came late. And so a lot of jokes as to why he came late. Was it that he was he had to walk all the way from Bauchi? Why did he come late? And I can still remember at the end of our first term in King's College, uh, where everybody's assembled and they read out the form order. And the form order is the examination results. And you go to your class on the last day of term and they read out the order and it starts with the lowest the last person in the school, in the class, and it goes right up until the first person in the school. And I can distinctly remember, you know, um, all waiting and waiting, and everybody thought that Umar Alka's name would be among the first to be mentioned. And I can still remember my name being mentioned as fourth in the class, and I can remember Umar Alka being mentioned as third in the class. And um, it's, it, 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 it was a fascinating moment for all of us because after that, the attitude towards Umuru Alka changed because he had mm. shown, though he was from Bauchi, he was outstanding. And in the people who, the Northerners who came in lower six, again, they were selected on merit. And a few were a little bit behind at the beginning, but not far behind. And it's very interesting because the Northerners who came in lower six into King's College, we used to, um, if anything, we used to laugh, laugh at them a little bit because they studied all the time. And we felt that they should be spending time having fun. They should be spending more time on games and clubs and society, but they were studying and studying and studying. And certainly by the end of the first term, those who were not at the same level as the other classmates had caught up. And, I, and that left me, that experience in King's College left me with the, the, the view, talent is evenly distributed across mm. the world, across ethnic groups, across income groups, across classes. The, what goes wrong in a lot of times is that we do not select, or we do not have the institutions that select and give opportunities to the very best, to the very ablest in each of the ethnic groups within our countries, within each of the income groups. And that is, in my view, the source of the problems that we have within Nigeria. Mm. So um, let's take it from here to yeah. Yeah, um, education in the UK and the US. Yeah. What was yeah. fundamentally different with the education you got in the UK, US, um, that altered their part in, in, in life? What, what will you attribute? 
Okay, I think that um, from the UK, uh, there are a number of things I think that I gained, um, in particular from both Oxford and Cambridge universities. Um, number one, obviously, it is fascinating when you're studying a subject and you're being taught by the professors, by the tutors who wrote the classic books mm. of that subject. I mean, there's, mm. there's nothing that can be more um, encouraging, fascinating. You know, you, you, there's a book on history or there's a book in law and the man who wrote the book that you've heard so much about is the man teaching you. That was a fascinating experience, okay? So the sense of rubbing your minds, okay, with the very best minds in other parts of the world was, was excellent. It, 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 it gave me a sense of confidence because you, you now realize as an African, you are equal to these other people. And therefore there was no need for you to be intimidated by them. That was one thing I got from it. The second thing for me was that it was an opportunity for me to meet other Africans other African Americans and to to learn from them to share our common experiences all of us uh, 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 being Africans and that was a great experience and I think the third experience which um, I got from it was I have to say that I was always very very impressed by the humility and the simplicity that I saw in a lot of the leading British academics I mean, I think that I came from a uh, very much from a, a certain Nigerian culture of the big man. And if you are a vice chancellor or you're a permanent secretary or a very big businessman, everybody must know who you are. And you must talk and walk and behave in a certain fashion. Um, I always sort of, and I never, I, I always was fascinated just seeing, you know, the world's leading authority in law or one of the most famous professors of, of chemistry on a bicycle or just walking around campus like everybody else. And mm. so I think I left very much influenced by that um, sense of simplicity um, and by that very unassuming characteristic that you often see in the university environment abroad. And it gave me a sense that, 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 that you don't have to be showy. You don't have to, you don't have to, um, let everybody feel in psychologically intimidated by yourself in order to be somebody. And um, it's, 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 a, it's something that I hope has not left me uh, over the years. So um, I will just quickly dive into the Nigerian experience. Yes. Everybody just wants to know, how did it happen that a 39 year old was able to acquire majority shares in a bank like the UBA, what happened? All right. Okay. It, this is not something that I think I've, I've ever spoken about, but um, in public, but I will say a little bit about it. Um, I, my ambition when I was younger was to work in the public service and to work in the university. So I started out my life and my career wanting to be an academic. The academic part of me was very much influenced by, by my stay in England and America and just loving and admiring my professors. The sense of public service was very much drilled into me by my, by my, by my father. And I saw myself as oscillating you know, between the two. Um, I never ever in my wildest dreams imagined that I would be a businessman. It's just something that I, I ever thought of myself in that way, um, that you know, man proposes, God disposes. And so when I left Harvard Business School, and I went to Harvard Business School, not so much to educate me in how to make money, but I felt that understanding how to manage state institutions, how to manage parastatals, was an important part of public service. And while, yes, there was a time at which um, the study of history, the study of political science and economics was important in the civil service training, I also increasingly started to believe that business, the study of business was important in managing that. So when I came back to Nigeria, I worked in the government of Nigeria um, under President Shagari, and I also worked there under President Buhari. I have to be honest and admit that I got my positions there uh, because of the personal connections of my 
my father, who was gynecologist to the president's office for many years. Uh, but however, after uh, two coup d'etats, I decided that maybe this was time for me to leave the government and try my hand at something in the private sector. While in the government, I had seen a lot of opportunities in the petroleum sector, and therefore I believed that um, these are opportunities that I could take advantage of. I was very, very early. I was one of the first in that particular area. And therefore, having, having studied the international oil market at Harvard Business School, having worked in the government for five or six years in the president's office, I was, in a sense, uniquely equipped to take advantage of this area, which was just really beginning to, to take off. But I have to say that after I'd been in the business for a while, I had mostly been um, a consultant or an agent. I very much wanted to be in a situation in which I could be an owner. I could be a boss in my own sense of things. And at the particular time that I, enter, I, I, I was thinking about, um, the opportunities were not in petroleum to be an owner of something of yourself. Babang, President Babangida had, 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 uh, had done away with import licenses. He was beginning the liberalization of the Nigerian economy and opportunities were opening up um, in many, many areas. Um, it's something that I think that he's not given sufficient credit for, but the, in a sense, the opening up, the removal of the state from having um, an overwhelming position within the government started very much at this time. And it's something that I think he, he needs to be credited for whatever other mistakes uh, he may have made. Um, the area in which the opportunities were the most, were, were the most obvious were in finance. And, um, and um, I had heard that the government was going to be privatizing some institutions. And, um, and they were going to be privatizing the big banks. And the way in which the government was going to be privatizing the banks was that they were going to be selling the shares on an equal states basis. Or rather, they were selling the shares divided into different senatorial districts. So each senatorial district more or less had an allocation that was made uh, to them. So, so, so I came up with the idea, would it be fascinating if a group of young people who came from all over Nigeria, who came from different parts of Nigeria, different religions, northerners, middle belt, east, west, southern minorities, if we could not put together a group of people that came from all these areas, and if on the basis of that, given the way in which shares were being sold on a senatorial uh, uh, base, uh, district basis, couldn't we all come together and seize control of a major institution like a big state bank? And my thinking was very much that wouldn't it be exciting, wouldn't it be a great demonstration if these banks badly run, in great trouble, many of them almost bankrupt, to be honest with you, if us young people who were complaining that, that there was no political space for us, if we could all come together, take over a bank, and change that bank, reform that bank, and make that bank better over a period of years, then we would have accomplished something significant, both for the country, for the banking industry, and for ourselves. So I'm very proud of what we did in United Bank of Africa. I mean, in financial terms, we took a bank that was worth about, say, 15 million US dollars, price 15 million US dollars when we bought it, when we, we bought into it. And I think that by the time we, 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 we sold the bank, I think that it had a valuation of somewhere close to two to three hundred million dollars a year. So mm. our, our, our hard work and our efforts multiplied the value of the bank by at least 
10 to 15 times in US dollar terms at a time at which the Naira was devaluing constantly against the dollar. So that's one metrics. But the bigger, the more important metrics for me was that we were able to demonstrate that if you hired a management team that was that consisted of some of the ablest people from different parts of Nigeria, they could work together harmoniously. They could go beyond their own ethnic differences, and they could and they could make a success of things. So, I, so I'm enormously proud of the fact that the UBA team that um, I uh, you know I brought together had probably a quarter to a third were northerners in management and included Lamido Sanusi, who became central bank governor, Suleiman Barrow, who became deputy governor of central bank, Abba Kiari, who became um, a, a, a chief of staff, um, Mahmoud Dutse, who today is permanent secretary of finance, Aliu Diko, who today has founded one of the great pension funds uh, there, uh, Mohamed Balarabe, um, you know, who uh, retired recently as an executive director of a, of a major bank, largely run uh, by Southerners. Abdullahi Usman, who was chief of staff to Mohammed Jega. And I could just list a whole range of very able Northerners who worked hmm. side by side. Uh, Kim, this, is, Kim, this, is an, this is a very interesting dimension. So what I'm hearing today is that UBA turned out to be some sort of academy. Um, of people who went on to make good in public and private life. Yes, yes, um, yes. That is very true. And um, and and when you look at the our UBA alumni association, if, if we ever yes. formed an alumni association, you will find the list of very many able people who went on to do uh, really superb things you know, with their lives. But the most important thing for me is that. As a group, we demonstrated that talent is there throughout this country. It's an issue of selecting, not being a godfather who selects your boys, who just takes instructions from you, but far more important is that we look for able people from all over the country and together we work together for a common objective. Kim, let me ask you a question that everybody on my page has been asking. If this was 2020 and you are yes. 39, yes. would you be able to acquire UBA today? Um, I think it would be, be very difficult um, <laughs> for a number of reasons. I think much more now. Um, uh, number one, it was a very different central bank. Okay. And I think that the, I think that a lot of the regulatory agencies right now, um, let me just choose my words very carefully, they're more interventionist than I think that they need to be. In fairness to the central bank at the time, all right, they gave us a lot of latitude all right, in allowing these young people to do a lot of very controversial things that, 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 it, that su succeeding central banks may not have allowed us to do. I don't know. They may or they may not have done so. Um, I also think that today the financial markets are very different and it's very difficult for new entrants to come into an institution the way we did at that particular time. But I do think very much that there are spaces the young people of Nigeria can make a tremendous contribution and can do their own thing. And the, the area that I think that young people can make that contribution in particular is the area of technology. The fact of the matter is that my generation fundamentally does not understand, is not comfortable with technology. We try our best to be, but it's not our bread and butter. And I think that in the next 10, 15, 20 years, Technology is going to change the way in which a lot of things are done. It will change the way financial services are rendered. It will change the way pensions, insurance, the way medicine, um, the way uh, the retail trade is done. 
And, and I think that it, it, it will happen at much um, lower costs than, than, than is obtaining in these existing industries. And I think that that revolution is going to be done by young people. I think our generation can delay it somewhat by not encouraging these changes and by not encouraging young people, but we cannot stop it. And therefore, I think that in 20 years time, we'll sit down. If, assuming that you are still doing these interviews, you will be interviewing a young man who, through the use of technology, whether it's data analytics, whether it is uh, IT, whether it's artificial intelligence, you'll be interviewing him about the revolution that he or she um, 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 fomented by its application to a particular sector of the economy that I cannot predict right now. Mm. So, Kim, let me now specify. Um, in, in the world of 1980s, I could see that a lot of the young bank founders then, you were one of those who went through the roots of acquisition. But the founders of banks like uh, Tedo Pitiside, uh, Folladio, I mentioned, a yeah. host of them, Taya Derinoku, they were able to raise capital from older traders and businessmen of those days yeah. who trusted them with their 5 million naira that was the seed money required to start a bank. Um, will you trust a 31 year old today to make an investment in his tech company? And if no, what are the reasons why you won't do it? Um, there are two things that I have to say that are different. No, 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 no. I'll answer that question in two ways. Yes, I think I, I would be willing to trust a young person in the tech area to do that. I would be. I'd be willing to take that risk. All right. Um, the second thing I think I need to point out is that the amounts of money that you required to set up banks in those days were not as humongous as it looks now. Mm. All right? All right? Mm -hmm. you know, so, so now it looks billions, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. you will need. But in those days, you know, it was, you know, I, I can't remember the figure, but it was certainly under 50 million Naira. All right? Five million, five million to start yeah, a bank in 1990. It was yeah. five million in 1990. Yeah, so, so the things were not humongous. And therefore, don't forget that at a time, there were about a hundred, probably about a hundred banks. Yes. Okay? And, 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 and some people have said Babangida licensed too many. Uh, my own view is that in many respects, it was better to license a large number and let them all compete in the marketplace. And you see which ones of those 100 emerge. Right? And I think that in many respects, the, 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 the fittest have been, in, in many respects, emerged you know, you know, successfully. So and not as much money was needed then as, as, as we think. So if somebody wanted to buy a bank today, a young person, no, nobody's going to trust him with the billions that he's going to need. But in the space that he can play in, very successfully, in my view, in the tech space, the amounts of money needed are not as humongous. And I think mm. that people will be willing to risk some money with that person. Um, and it, it really comes down to an issue of trust and, 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 and a sense that this is a young person who, who will keep him briefed, keep him informed, and is not trying to play him or cheat him. But well, Kim, let me take this to regulators. Don't you think that the regulators have gone overboard in determining huge amounts of capital for banks? Wouldn't it have been better to allow startups in the banking space um, the, maybe determine the kind of transactions they can do, but allow for small capital banks to come? Because I, it looks to me like there was an overkill by the regulators. What do you think? Um, um, that's a very difficult one. That's a very difficult one. And the reason why I say it's a difficult one is the following, is that um, given the losses that a lot of banks have suffered in the past, 
banks need a certain level of capital, okay, to act as buffers to prevent the collapse of the bank. Mm. And don't forget, the collapse of a bank, unlike the collapse of, say, a a um, a um, a brewery, a, a brewery, or or, or or somebody who's in the food business, something else like that, it carries with it the depositors are losing their funds. All right. So so in that sense, the, 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 all central banks have to be particularly careful. All right. And mm. have to ensure capital buffers because they are then forced in a situation where they have to start looking after large numbers of deposits, de depositors. So, so that's an issue on capital. But I do think that a lot of the regulations regarding fintech need to be relaxed. And I think that I think that we need to have an environment that allows the participation of more technology companies in the fintech business. And I think that, 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 that can be done in a way that is consistent, okay, with the health of the of, of, of the banks. Kim, let me come in quickly here. You founded FSDH, um, the first yes. discount house. Yes. And there are still many people who argue that an investment bank, a merchant bank who does not take large deposits from the public, uh, yes. does not require the type of capital, 10 billion naira today, to start yes. an investment house. So if you were today, yes. you may not have been able to have started FSDH. Yes. And aren't we giving a one size in insurance? We're asking for 10 billion naira in insurance and yes. all that. And it links to what the business, the big ticket items you can do. Um, yes. Because what I'm asking this question is your yeah, advice to young people. What are the areas you've mentioned, the tech area? Um, and I would like you to look at other areas in transport, mm -hmm. in logistics, in agriculture. What are the possibilities for them? But aren't you thinking that the regulators are? Uh, there's too much requirement for capital these days. Yes, um, yeah, I would say it, I, I would I would agree with you. I think that there should be opportunities for different categories of uh, financial institutions. Yes. Um, I, when I look at the United States, for example, um, you have very many different categories of financial institutions. Not all of them have these huge capital requirements. And um, and, I, and I, I I I would agree with you that I think that um, we need to be much more flexible. I want you to think through very carefully what capital requirement, what is the capital requirement that is truly needed for a business. And, yes. um, and because otherwise what happens then is that the capital requirement becomes a barrier to entry. And yes. all it does is that it simply protects existing players, some of whom are inefficient, some of whom are not modernizing. And I think that all industries always need to have a group of new entrants, younger entrants, who are coming in and challenging the incumbents. I think, I think, I think that is of fundamental importance. Now, let me pivot straight into the Etisalat. How did you yes. get it all wrong when the first yes. bid round about the telcos we had done? You were one of those who lost out in the bid yes. when them came on stream. How did you get it all wrong? And what does that tell you about the Nigerian market? Um, um, well, I would, I would say that in fairness, and I don't mean to say this um, to be self-serving, but uh, with the possible exception of, um, of um, Econet, no, 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 of, of Adenuga, I would say, um, who led his round, the, most of the other bidders were led by foreign companies. And the local partners were very much the junior people in the arrangement. And, and at that time, I think that most of the foreign companies who led the bids, who determined the bid price, just didn't believe that the Nigerian market were as big as it proves to be. Um, I would say to you that I, I remember being very much um, in the bid group at that time with my then partner, uh, uh, Orastrom, um, the Egyptian uh, billionaire, uh, who had done such a good job uh, in setting up Arascom within Egypt. And um, my heart fell 
when he um, decided that this was the maximum bid that he was willing to put in, and he left at that particular point. But, but the Western world, or rather, let's just say a lot of the Western experts, underestimated the size of the Nigerian market. They underestimated the size of the Nigerian informal sector. And therefore, their views as to the market size very much wrong. When Nagib Sawires exited the bid, his share price in Egypt went up. So convinced were people that he had escaped a bad fate. But as we later on got to realize, the market was bigger than a lot of Western experts thought. So that's what went wrong on that first bid. Second question following from that is, seeing that we couldn't always predict Nigeria's market, hmm. what is your take about people who grew up in Nigeria, who know the Nigerian market, versus those who schooled abroad with their Harvard MBAs and their hmm. bright degrees from Cambridge? If you were hiring today, are you going to hire only the people with, with foreign great degrees, or are you going to also be looking at people with the local knowledge of the markets? Well, I can just share with you my experience um, in, 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 in when I was in the petroleum business, when I was at FSDH, and when I was at, at United Bank of Africa. And there, I, we had more people who had studied in Nigeria than people who had studied abroad. I, I basically think that you need all, all kinds of people in an institution. I think that the... The thing that people who are brought up and trained locally, what they tend to have, or what they often have, they have, in a very real sense, a very clear picture of how things are. They have mm. their feet on the ground. They are attuned to the various workarounds and the various ways in which you have to solve problems. They understand what it is to run a business without electricity. They understand what it is to run something without equipment. They understand how sometimes equipment needs to be fixed because you don't have enough time to order the spare parts. So there's no doubt in my mind that anybody who has had a, a foreign education, who is not working hand in hand with a person who was groomed locally is going to fail in that business because he needs mm -hmm. that, local, um, that local input from the, from the person. And he always has to remember that that person is as intelligent as he is. He has not gone abroad, not because he's not intelligent, but more likely because he didn't have the opportunity or his parents did not have the funds. Now, what does the person who went abroad, what does he bring to the table? He has often, if he used his mind, and if he was open, and if he took advantage of being abroad, he has had a, a, a picture it develops a sense of how things could be because mm -hmm. he has seen how things work in other domains. He has developed a whole set of hopefully connections and people he, people who he knows who can bring uh, international funding. He has contact with international companies and therefore he can, he, he can see a different situation. Now, obviously, you need both in that sense. The man who has a picture of how things operate elsewhere will fail if he simply thinks that that can be brought here and not adapted. And the mm. man who, has, who, who understands everything that is here also needs, in a sense, someone to say, why don't we try it this way? So, so my sense about things that always collaboration between both groups of people is what you need. And when I, when I teach at Harvard Business School, the first thing I teach all the, my, 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 my students there is, don't leave Harvard Business School. Go back to Africa and not respect, invite as your partners, students or, or people who have not been trained totally locally because you have something to teach them and they have something to teach you. And it's in your teamwork and collaboration that lies the path to success. Kim, at this time, I'm going to take a question from one of my um, viewers who I've let into the studio. Um, 
if I in Chukujeku from London, I will ask him to um, ask a question right now. Good. If I were, um, you're very welcome. Oh, if I your mic, can you unmute your mic? I'm trying to unmute you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Kim. It's uh, really been, uh, been, uh, been uh, enlightening, 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 enlightening listening to you. Um, I have uh, actually followed your 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 career. Uh, you need to unmute yourself, if any. Um, I have you in, yes, I have you in two, yes, so it's echoing. You can come down the volume in one. Okay, how do I, how do I, how do I close out, close out? Okay, I will leave one, okay, I will leave one, okay, I will leave one, okay, I will leave one. Okay, okay. Okay. Yes. yes. That, that's better now. Yes, I, 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 I believe Osita has that asked some of the questions uh, I wanted to ask, um, but I note um, through your um, responses to some questions, you, um, you, uh, I, I remember you saying something about making um, a, a, a career outside government. Now, um, given that um, to uh, a large ex extent, by and large, that uh, a lot of things are driven by government policy, uh, in Nigeria, and and I I think your inroad into UBA uh, is a perfect example. Um, do you have any kind of like um, advising to like I mean, of course, uh, influencing. Well, apart from being in government, <laughs> how would how would um, how would you advise say, uh, entrepreneurs to kind of um, uh, it, try to influence policy that that provides an enabling environment. Is it through, say, for instance, de developing um, um, proposals which would uh, uh, enlighten the the government to um, to the benefits of certain ventures? But again, you still, I guess, in the Nigerian context, you still need. To have a way to pitch to pitch those proposals. Okay, okay. Um, um, I, I, I would I, I'd like to I'd like to respond in the following way. Um, first of all, I probably I do I I will I did not exp explain myself as clearly as I should, as I should have, and I apologize for that. Um, mm -hmm. What I meant to say was that my father very much encouraged his children into the frame of mind that do not think of the government as the only employer. Mm -hmm. And that's because the generation of the 1960s, young people in the 60s and the 70s, early 70s, we thought of, often thought of government as where we were going to work. And so my father was very insistent that, that you must have a, a life outside of the government so that if at any time you needed to leave the government, either because you, you, you felt you're being treated unfairly, you felt there was a change of government, that you could survive outside of the government. So I think that was the point I was trying to make, not that people should not work in the government. Okay, that's number one. The second thing I would like to say is that my honest opinion is that in many respects, government needs outstanding individuals to work there. Certainly. Because the problems of governing are in many respects more complex, in many respects more difficult than a lot of the problems that the private sector has. <laughs> and <laughs> if there's a problem that I see that we do have in Nigeria, is that is that um, we the bureaucracy, the, the 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 civil service needs to be a destination point for some of our best and our brightest. And if you look at the, the civil services or the government services of China, of France, of Japan, of Great Britain, um, of the United Arab Emirates, for example, <laughs> you will find them staffed by truly outstanding, intelligent, and hardworking people. So, so I want to make that point. So some we need bright people in government. We need bright people in the, in the private sector. Now, 
And then the third element I just want to stress is that it is important that we do not look, private and private sector do not look upon the government as a necessary evil. Yes. All right. And oftentimes there's this approach that there are these people who are there just to cause us problems. All right. And, um, and, and instead, we need to look upon the government and government officials the way you look upon a customer. That is, that is, you've got to try and ask yourself the question, I need to convince him. I need to make him my friend. I need to explain to him why we're going in this particular direction and what are the elements of this enabling environment that, 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 that he needs to put in place for both the country and our businesses to survive. We have to do that understanding as I have been as an ex-government official myself, understanding that among a lot of government officials, there's a lot of skepticism about the sincerity of businessmen and, mm. and, and, and a sense that they're just there for themselves. All right? And, and I think that um, uh, businessmen uh, understanding and, and, and working to ensure that they have open lines with these government officials um, is a crucial part of their success and it's something that they must pay very close attention to at all times. Yes, Sotoye, um, I'll be asking Sotoye to ask a question. Um, Sotoye, let's, can you unmute? Um, yeah. yes. Good day, uh, thank you very much. It has been a very enlightening session. Um, so my question for you will um it's in rest is a question to one of the response you gave during the conversation when you spoke of institutions across um, different social strata to identify um talents you know that will be poised to deliver value to nigeria and the question is how can yeah. we build those institutions and in your response to it, if I, you, you rightly said the civil service needs to be rejigged. Um, the question is, how can that happen? Because if we need um, in Nigeria that works, if we, if we get all the amazing insights from this mentorship um, sessions, how then can we bring them to bear if, if these talents are not identified, are not harnessed, and put in positions to deliver value to Nigeria? Um, I'll quickly cite an example. An, an example, these young men, um, Ikoi boys, they've been in Nigeria, you know, doing great movies, great songs, there's an echo. Hello, yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you, I can hear you. Yeah, okay, um, until Netflix came on board and identified them, you know, before the whole of Nigeria started screaming like, um, they were the best directors, you know, like forever. So how can we put up these institutions, um, the organizations that you have um, chaired in the past, you know, you spoke of UBA, how is it a culture in UBA to identify the talent other than the staff, you know, generally across board for Nigeria, how can we begin to build these institutions that will showcase the talents that we have across different social strata? Thank you. All right then. Okay, um, that is a very that's a very good question, and it's a very difficult question. Um, I'll take it. I'll try and tackle it at two different levels. At the macro level, we definitely need more people in the political space who have an understanding that the project of building a better and a greater Nigeria is not going to be successful if we do not show a proper appreciation for the tremendous amount of talent within the country. As long as mo too many of the political class, they see their, their role as essentially placing in positions of, of, uh, of authority, placing within, within government institutions, let's put it, say, their godsons or their goddaughters to do their bidding, we will not get anywhere. So um, um, difficult as, as it is, 
there will there definitely has to be the entry into the political space of people who have a different approach to the political life and therefore the economic and social future of the country. So that is at the macro level. But I think that um, at our own level, and when I say our own level, uh, I'm talking about people like myself who are in leadership positions. I just think that we don't make enough of an effort a lot of times to make real efforts to look for bright young Nigerians and, and, and give them a platform. And I, I just want to give an example. Um, I've been I've been away from UBA for about 15 to 20 years now. And it's amazing that the ex-UBA people that greets me and that I constantly meet over and over again, all right, and are most, um, should I say, uh, appreciative of whatever small efforts I made, are a group of people which I didn't really think about with much in much detail or with much depth when i started a program okay in which we said nigerians young nigerians who have first class or upper second class honors degree in the universities in any subject we will hire 2000 of them every year automatically for youth call all right and during that youth corps period, they will be attached to various branches in the country. And at the end of that two-year period, they will hopefully have had some experience in banking, which will enable them to get other jobs. And a few of them we will hire um, and they will join the bank. And it's, it, it's, it, I find it fascinating. It, what, it wasn't a difficult thing for me to do at the time. What, when I look back, it's... I, I'm amazed at how many of the people who did the, the youth call during that time, who I meet today, 10, 20 years later, who come up to me and say, thank you very much for the opportunity you gave us. And I just can't remember the guy who said I was part of the, of the youth call program. So I, I think that if we, if, if the leaders in a lot of companies in Nigeria, um, uh, 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 state governments had some of these programs in which they looked out for, tried to find, tried to encourage young people who have these kinds of qualities and give them a platform that enables them to take the next step. Then I think that we would have, yeah. uh, we would have made uh, great progress. Kim, somebody called Asogwa to Chuku Nelson, just wrote a message down that he benefited from that program and that he's very grateful to you. He's watching this live right now, and he just Thank wrote that he's going to be the program. And we're going to be bringing this to an end, King, but I yeah. would like you to say, um, you've had your fair share of successes, you have your fair share of setbacks. Um, yes. So it is a lot, I will consider one of those when your yeah. Mubadala had to leave yeah. Nigeria. Yeah. <laughs> what is your three key messages to Nigerian young people? Um, just the way you advise me, I just want to give you this last moment. And somebody also asked, what would you like to be remembered for? Kim, the businessman, Kim, the entrepreneur, or Kim, the lecturer? Kim, the academic. Okay. Which of them would you like to be remembered for? Okay. Um, let, me, let, 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 me, let me start by the messages. Uh, the, uh, num number one, for young people. It is very easy and it's eminently understandable to despair. <coughs> All right. And in your mind, I want young people to understand that. Can you imagine what it must have been like for a young person, either just before or just after the Civil War? How, given all those who lost their lives, given what Nigeria went through, given the state of the whole of the eastern part of Nigeria, and yet out of the depths of that emerged a stronger country. And people um, escaped from, 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 from the sadness, from the despair, and the horror of that situation to something better. So therefore, I, I, um, if, you, if you think historically, do not despair. That's number one. Um, the second thing is that, and it's something that worries me very much, is the, is the, is the way in which 
we are evolving a certain culture of ethnic bigotry and religious bigotry within the country. Uh, and I understand to some degree why people escape into that solution, but I want young people to understand it is not a solution to our problems and that uh, yes, there are mistakes that are being made by, by, by federal, state, and local governments, but we must remain with the, with, the, with the clear idea and the clear picture in our minds that we are all Nigerians with a common humanity, with the common fears, with common ambitions for our, for, for our children, and we must overcome these differences and we must work together. That's the second message I want to give. The oh. third message you know, I, I want to give, and, and that is important, is that in, 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 young in, your, in your youth, it's the time to dare, to think differently, and to take some risks, to have some setbacks, and not to be discouraged. And therefore, and therefore I would say, educate yourself as much as you can. A lot can be gained online. Keep yourself open to, to new experiences and, and understand that the road that my generation traveled is different from the road that my father's generation traveled. And therefore, you may be speaking, you may need to go down different roads from the ones we have done. The only thing that remains in common are the issues of hard work, the issues of the importance of seriousness and the importance of teamwork and collaboration, those things remain forever. Mm. Now, how do I want to be remembered? Um, I think that um, the way I want to be, want to be remembered, um, it reminds me very much of, um, that question reminds me very much of a statement that was once made that ultimately each person is judged not by your seniors who confuse sycophancy with ability, not by your classmates who are often confused by issues of rivalry or envy, but you are ultimately, each person ultimately judged by the next generation. Because it's the next generation that can tell whether or not there was something in what you did in your life that made a contribution. Therefore, um, the honor it would not be to be called an entrepreneur. It would not be to be called a great professor. Uh, it would not be to be a government official. It would be simply to be remembered as a person who, um, by my efforts, by my conversation, and, and by my career, encouraged younger people to be able to do things that they never imagined that they could do and do these things successfully and become the better for it. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Kim. And uh, this has been a wonderful outing. Um, as I expected, that we're going to benefit from the wealth of your knowledge. The comments are streaming in, the questions are popping at me, but we can't take much again for today. Hopefully, and very hopefully, at the end of the uh, pandemic, I hope to organize a physical uh, mentorship program and I will be inviting people. I'm sure Kim will be one of those who will be bringing on stage to discuss these issues in depth, have real interaction with people. What I have heard here today, what I see today is that um, there are unchanging principles in changing times. So hard work, commitment, you know, focus uh, will always not change. Like I always said, uh, the words in Igbo, uche, uchu, neubuchu. Uche, uchu, for more changing principles that will always continue to guide people in changing times. So for all those watching, I thank you very much. And we will continue to do the Mekaria Mentorship Series. Um, Kim is now a lecturer uh, teaching at the Harvard Business School. Uh, he's still very much active in business and will be tapping on his knowledge. One of the things I will say, and um, um, for this, I will not make an advert,
but I know he had invested in Andela, which is a Nigerian and African focused IT company. So if you have those good, wonderful ideas and you have those great ideas, uh, you know, tell me. And if I can get a time in his calendar to mention it, it must be something really great. It must be something scalable. It must be something that have that you have personal integrity and passion for. Um, but I believe that there are opportunities for young people in Nigeria today. Thank you very much, Kim. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much, Usita. I'm delighted. And I'd like to thank everybody who was in the audience. And Usita, if you could compile some many of the questions that were on the screen, please do send them to me. It will be helpful for okay. me, and I would like to respond to everybody. Oh, fantastic. All right. God thank bless. you very much, everybody. I will be able to send those questions. I will compile them, and then I will bring them back to the page. Looking forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, and God bless you, you all. Much. Bye. Good night, and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. bye.